Welcome and thank you all for standing by. At this time, all parties are in a listen-only mode to today's question and answer session. Throughout this conference, questions will only be taken via the phone lines. If you do have a question, you can press star 1. I would like to inform all parties that this conference is being recorded, and if for any reason you object to that, you may disconnect at this time. I will now hand the conference over to Irene I here. Ms. I you may begin. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene I here of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. On January 20th, 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued the final version of the guidance document, Submission and Review of Sterility Information and Pre-Market Notification 510K Submissions for Devices Labeled as Sterile. This guidance seeks to ensure that manufacturers incorporate adequate sterilization methods for 510K devices labeled as sterile and provide appropriate documentation and information to the FDA for pre-market review for established and novel sterilization processes. The final guidance also provides additional details about the pyrogenicity testing information that sponsors should include in a 510K submission. The focus of today's webinar is to review the document and help manufacturers and other interested stakeholders understand the information provided in this final guidance. Your presenter is Stephen Turtell, a biologist from the Office of Device Evaluation. Following the presentation, we will open the line for your questions related to the topics in this guidance only. Additionally, there are other center subject matter experts available to assist with the Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I give you Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Steve Turtell. I'm a biologist with the Division of Orthopedic Devices, and the subject of today's webinar is the new guidance, Submission and Review of Sterility Information and Pre-Market Notification Submissions for Devices Labeled as Sterile. Uh, this was issued on January 21st, but I want to bring immediately to your attention that there is a 60-day delayed implementation period. This is to allow industry to prepare prospective submissions, to allow for completion of 510K submissions currently under review, and to allow for training of FDA review staff on new device guidance and review procedures. So this will be fully implemented on March 21st, 2016. And uh, to provide a little bit more guidance on the middle bullet, that means that all new submissions received on or after March 21st will be subject to the new guidance document. So this is an outline of the webinar. We're going to go into the background a little bit, talk about the scope, what's included and what's not, talk about the sterilization method categories, and information to be included in submissions. Taking a look at the background, going back to, to 1990, the very first guidance that was published on this issue was the K90-1. It was published to bring greater consistency to review processes across all divisions and product classes. In 2002, this was updated, and this, was, this update was issued to address several significant changes that had occurred in the regulatory environment, including the DAMA in particular. In 2008, a draft was proposed to address advances in sterilization technology, provide clear definition for novel sterilization methods, as well as update the guidance related to pyrogenicity claims. And finally, in 2016, the final was published and this was a revision that was uh, intended to provide public comment resolution uh, for the 2008 draft, which provides clarification of the scope, clear definition of the novel sterilization methods, and additional guidance related to the pyrogenicity issues. So all of these, each of these steps were uh, provided uh, to assure greater 510K reduced consistency. One item I'd like to add here is that during the public comment resolution period, we actually received uh, public comments from a good number of, of sources, including device manufacturers, contract sterilizers, test labs, and a trade association. The scope of this guidance is limited to the review of 510Ks for devices labeled as sterile that are subject to industrial terminal sterilization processes based on microbial inactivation. Taking a look at the exclusions from the 2008 draft, <clears throat> outside the scope of 
the guidance document are processes that rely on microbial exclusion rather than microbial inactivation. Examples of those are filtration and septic processing. The other exclusions include processes intended to, be ster to sterilize medical devices that incorporate materials of animal origin, processes intended to be used by reprocessors of single-use devices, there's a separate guidance document for that, and information on cleaning, disinfection, and steriliza sterilization of reusable devices that are reprocessed in healthcare facilities. There's also a separate dedicated guidance document for that, which was actually updated about one year ago. So this was from the 2008 draft, and based on public comment resolution, we actually wound up adding two additional exclusions that includes item number one and number four, sterilizers that are themselves medical devices subject to 510K review. And it excludes processes that incorporate the use of liquid chemical sterilants. So moving on to Roman numeral four, methods of sterilization. You may recognize these methods from earlier, uh, earlier uh, versions of the guidance document, traditional sterilization methods, non-traditional sterilization methods, and novel non-traditional sterilization methods. And in the 2008 draft, there was another section that followed it, which included examples of each. Moving up to the 2016 vinyl, final version, these are now, the nomenclature has changed, now we're looking at established category A, established category B, and novel sterilization methods. And integrated into each section are examples of each sterilization method. So taking a closer look, established category A methods. These are methods that have a long history of safe and effective use as demonstrated by ample literature, clearances of 510Ks or approvals of PMAs, satisfactory quality system inspections, and FDA recognized consensus standards for development, validation, and routine control. Examples of these include dry heat, ethylene oxide in fixed rigid chambers, moist heat, also known as steam, radiation, and examples include gamma and electron beam radiation. Taking a look at established category B, these are methods for which there are no FDA recognized dedicated consensus standards. There is published information on development, validation, and routine control. And FDA has previously evaluated sterilization development and validation data for specific sterilizers using discrete cycle parameters and determined the validation methods to be adequate. Examples of established category B are hydrogen peroxide, ozone, and flexible bag systems. And the third category is novel sterilization methods. These are newly developed methods for which there is little or no published information, no history of comprehensive FDA evaluation of sterilization development and validation data through an FDA clearance or a PMA approval for the devices that are subjected to these, these sterilization methods, and no FDA recognized dedicated consensus standards on development, validation, and routine control. FDA has not reviewed and determined these methods to be adequate to effectively sterilize the device. Examples of these include vaporized peracetic acid, high intensity light or pulse light, <clears throat> microwave radiation, sound waves, and ultraviolet light. So this is the key message uh, throughout the guidance document. Evaluation by FDA of validation data. Where the specific process has not been evaluated by FDA, because the parameters of an FDA-cleared sterilizer have been altered or because the validation data have just not been evaluated based on the submission, uh, on a particular submission, we consider these methods to be novel. Um, and the under underlying theme here is that it's important for us, we're looking for a high degree of assurance that each method has been adequately validated. And whether that means we're looking at conformity to standards or based on information we've already received, we want to know that the uh, validation has been performed adequately. And in, the, and in the instance of novel sterilization methods, we're going to be looking for the validation data at the, uh, for the first time. So that leads us, as a natural segue, actually, into the sterilization method. This is Roman numeral five of the guidance document. Sterilization information for devices labeled as sterile. So this goes back to 1990. This is the very first guidance document that was issued. And we're looking, back then we were looking at a number of items to help us 
have assurance that the validation has been conducted effectively, and uh, some other basic information about the submission. These include the sterilization method, the method used to validate the sterilization cycle, the sterility assurance level, a description of the packaging that's designed to maintain the product's sterility. sterility. If the sterilization involves ethylene oxide, we're looking at the, the ethylene oxide residuals, and whether or not the product, if the device is labeled pyrogen-free, we're looking at the method to make that determination. And finally, if the um, sterilization, sterilization dose is Sterilization methods, radiation, we're looking for the radiation dose. This is what we were looking for in 1990. I'm going to highlight a couple of these things um, straight. And these include the sterilization method, the radiation dose if radiation was used, and residuals of ethylene oxide if ethylene oxide was used. Just moving forward 12 years to 2002, the same information we're looking for, including the sterilization method, um, we have a little bit of misalignment here, sorry about that. We're looking for the radiation dose if radiation was used, and also ethylene oxide residuals if ethylene oxide was used. Moving forward to the 2008 draft guidance, we're looking at the sterilization method again, the radiation dose, and sterilant residuals. Um, in the 2008 version, we actually reorganized it, presented these up front, so they were, uh, because it just told a little bit better story, and in most applications we see these things straight up front. It makes it a little bit easier for the reviewers as well. Also, um, instead of just stating the um, ethylene oxide residuals, we expanded what we were looking for. We used the expression sterilant, sterilant residuals instead of just ethylene oxide because we know now there are other chemical sterilization methods. So taking that format and moving up to 2016, Again, we're looking for the sterilization method, the radiation dose if radiation is used, and the sterilant residuals, um, depending upon what the sterilant is. So what looks different here from the 2008 version is there's a whole new block of text right in the middle of the page, and this is section B, C, and D. So it's time for a closer look at that. And I want to bring up and remind you that, again, where the specific process has not been evaluated by FDA, we're interested in taking a closer look at that. We consider those methods to be novel, and, and this is part of the first step in identifying exactly which category of sterilization method the process belongs to. So we've added part B, C, and D, and taking a closer look at those, a description, whoops, just a description of the sterilization chamber if it's not rigid or fixed. We're also looking for information on established category B. If the sterilizer has received 510K clearance, then we'd like to see the 510K number included in this submission as well as the make and model of the sterilizer. Finally, we'd like to see information related to whether or not the cycles were altered. If the sterilizer has not received 510K clearance, this should be stated in the application. And if the sterilization method has been evaluated through clearance of a 510K or approval of a PMA, we'd like to see the submission number and the device master file number. If the cycle has changed since those clearances or approvals, we also want to know if the cycle has been altered. And lastly, we're taking a look at the sterilization site. In other words, we want to know the actual address of the sterilization facility. All of, all of this information will help us get confirmation or make a determination whether this is a, an established B or a novel method in particular. So moving on to item number two. In the 2008 draft, we we're looking for a description of the method used to validate the sterilization cycle, but not the validation data itself. And we expanded this to ask you to identify all relevant consensus standards. In item number three, we're looking for the sterility assurance level. And when we move up to 2016 version, the final version, we're asking for a description of the method used to validate the sterilization cycle, not the validation data, but all relevant consensus standards. And in the absence of recognized standards, a comprehensive description of the process and a complete validation protocol. Item number three is we're looking for the sterility assurance level and that really hasn't changed. We've just provided a little bit more guidance. 
looking back to the 2002 version and earlier, item number four is the pyrogenicity issue. If product is labeled as pyrogen-free, a description of the method used to make that determination, for example, for example, a limulus amoebocyte lysate test. So moving to 2008, we're asking for the same information, but we've provided more guidance and been a little bit more prescriptive about which devices we're looking for this information on. That's pyrogenicity testing, and that includes all blood contacting devices, implants, devices that contact cerebral spinal fluid, and devices labeled pyrogen-free or non-pyrogenic. We've also expanded the information that we're looking for with regard to the testing itself, identification of the testing endpoint, explanation supporting the selected endpoint, and whoops, at the bottom of that slide, we also provide some information on uh, additional guidance and references. So moving up to 2016, um, you'll note the color coding. We're still looking for, uh, we're providing uh, prescriptive information about which devices we'd like to see uh, pyrogenicity test information on. And the next block of text down, we're looking for a description of the method used to make the determination, identification of the chosen test limit, an explanation supporting the selected test limit. But we're also looking for the, number, the amount of endotoxins, endotoxin units per device. And in addition, we're looking for a statement confirming that endotoxin testing will be conducted on every batch, or if not, we're looking for a sampling plan and a justification for that. Uh, finally, again, at the bottom are several references, but these have been updated um, to make them more current. So the USP uh, chat, General Chapter 161 has been updated to the 2015 version. The AME ST72 has been updated to 2011. And the 2012 release of the guidance, Pyrogen Endotoxins Testing Questions and Answers from the FDA was issued and replaced the 1987 LAL testing guidance guideline from the FDA, which has been withdrawn. So um, an additional note on that, we received a lot of um, reviewer comment. I'm just going to move back one slide. We, um, we did receive a lot of comment with regard to the pyrogenicity testing. We had a number of comments that were saying, this was too prescriptive, then we also had a number of comments that said that final, you know, that this is a good thing. We're being more consistent with, for example, AMEST 72, which is FDA recognized, which does call for this information. Since that time, um, both the other two references that are listed there have all harmonized. So all four uh, publications right now, the three listed there, including the current guidance that we're talking about, are all harmonized on these issues. And the final item in 2008, we were looking at the description of the packaging, but not the package data itself. And this is the packaging that's designed to maintain the device's sterility. And when we move ahead to 2016, we're looking at a description of the package that's designed to maintain the device's sterility, but not the package test data, and a description of the package test methods. So we want a summary here of exactly what sorts of simulations were conducted and what sort of testing was done. For example, what sort of accelerated aging may have been conducted and how that was followed by field strength testing and what sort of simulated shipping and handling was conducted and what sort of package integrity was conducted after that. One additional note on this is there are exceptions. There are, for some device types, reviewed by some divisions, they do want to see package test data for certain expiration data, and I encourage you to be in contact with the division that reviews your particular device type to find out if you need to provide that information as well. So um, moving on, we're about to jump into the very last section, which is the novel sterilization methods. But before doing that, I would like to revisit um, some text from earlier slides. This is for established methods, and we've already seen this. This is excerpted from, yes, two different earlier slides. Um, for established method A and B, we're looking for a description of the sterilization method and a description of the method used to validate the sterilization cycle, all relevant consensus standards, and in the absence of recognized standard, a comprehensive description of the process and the complete validation protocol. So moving ahead and taking a look at the novel methods, 
we'll notice right off, and the first thing we're looking for, this is in addition to all of the information we've just discussed, everything that's documented in Section 5 above, we want to see that information, but in addition, we're looking for a comprehensive description of the sterilization process. So we really want to look at the details. Of course, what we're starting with here is we want to look at all of the validation information that we haven't seen before. So a comprehensive description of the method is what we're looking for to start off with. A method used to validate the sterilization cycle, the validation protocol, as well as the validation data for the process. FDA may also request additional information based on a specific device submitted for review. And this slide really just summarizes all the content changes from 2008 to 2016. This includes clarification of the nomenclature change. This, um, the previous version included traditional, non-traditional, and novel, non-traditional methods. And now we're looking at established A, established B, and novel methods. Added clarifications provided of FDA's review policy for new sterilization technologies, validation data accountability, that's the underlying theme, the key message that we're looking, that we mentioned earlier. So we want to know one way or another whether the validation data is sufficient because it is in conformity with existing standards or because we've looked at it already, or we want to know um, that we haven't looked at it and now is the time for us to take a look at the new validation data. Pyrogenicity recommendations and information requested have been updated, and updated guidance and expanded references have been provided throughout the guidance document. So that takes us to the end of the presentation period, and we're going to open it up for questions. Um, if for some reason you don't have a chance to get your question in or formulated today, um, we recommend that you get in touch with the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. You can just Google FDA.DICE, I'm sorry, FDA and DICE, and it'll be the first thing that, that pops up, or you can just um, use this connect right here, DICE at FDA.HHS.gov. Thank you very much. At this point in time, I think we'll open it up for questions. And with that, if you do have a question at this time, please press star 1 and record your first and last name at the prompt. Your name is required to introduce your question in the conference. Again, that is star 1 if you do have a question at this time. It will take just a moment for questions to come in. Please stand by. Our first question will come from Mary Dodoni. Your line is now open. Thank you very much. This is Mary Dodoni from Noxalizer. We're a new sterilization technology, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, we understand that we are currently classified as novel. We are, of course, in discussion with the FDA. Our understanding is that this guidance provides a migration path from the novel category to the um, established Category B. Could you comment on that? Sure. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's an item that was actually related to the very last slot, the previous slide. And that is um, a question that's come up um, as, as, as long ago as the 2002 version and the 2008 draft. Is, is this a static classification system or um, is it dynamic and is it possible that methods can move from, for example, from novel to, to, to established B or from established B to established A? And the answer is that it's not static. It's a dynamic system. And with uh, more experience that we gain um, and with more knowledge that we have of these systems and the confidence that we have in these systems, yes, it's very possible that a method can move from one of the categories to another one. Thank you. Our next question will come from Emily of 3M. Your line is open. Regarding the pyrogen, pyrogenicity claim updates, they've added in implants, but it doesn't classify what type of implants are dental implants since they do not contact blood, circulating blood. Are they included in this new blanket or are they still excluded from pyrogenicity requirements? Well, the language in the guidance is similar to the language that's in the USP and that's also 
in ST72, Amy ST72. Um, if you have questions about your particular device type, we would encourage you to get in contact with the division that reviews that particular device type because the guidances are general. They're not always all-inclusive. It's quite often that for particular device types, for neurology or for ophthalmic devices, or in this case dental devices, they may have additional recommendations or things that they're looking for. So we strongly recommend that you get in contact with, in this case, the dental branch. Okay, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I was questioning um, whether or not the, the guidance indicates that the FDA will inspect uh, the facility for those utilizing a novel sterilization technique. And I'm wondering, is this a mandatory inspection similar to a pre-approval inspection for a PMA, or is it um, rather a goal of the FDA whereby you could actually obtain 510K clearance without an inspection taking place? I think this may be a case-by-case -case situation. It depends on how much information comes in with the submission, how much information may already be uh, known by the agency, um, and how much not. Um, it may be case-by-case, -case, but it does. the guidance does lay out um, both options, and, um, and uh, again, it, it, it may be very much case-by-case. -case. I don't know if somebody else here may have a comment they'd like to add on that. Okay. We'll take our next question. Hello. Um, I have a question about uh, we have uh, several products. You know, there are uh, vascular device uh, contacting blood, and but there are clear sulfatin K before this guidance document. So they are not labeled as non-pyrogenic. So is FDA's expectation is for those products already cleared on the market to be non-pyrogenic and, and, and all it's just for new fatin K for the future sub submissions? So that's my question. If yes, how much time we have to be in compliance? That's my question. Thank you. Um, I think that we would ex – oh, my name is Rebecca Never. I'm with the Office of Device Evaluation. I think that we would expect that moving forward in your submissions, you would provide that information, but we are not expecting you to submit um, a new submission in order to provide that information on your existing devices. Okay. So does that mean for the product already cleared in – the previous 510K, we don't need to change the label uh, to label it as a non-pyrogenic, even their blood contacting? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Is the question that do you have to go and retroactively? Yeah. Yeah. For the product already cleared uh, to this day, and we already uh, choose not to put non-pyrogenic symbol on the label, are we uh, required by FDA to uh, put the non-pyrogenic claim on the label and substantiate that with uh, uh, testing for each lot? That's just my question for product already on the market. So I think we expect that you label your devices appropriately. Um, for the device type that they are, this is a guidance, and it is not um, – so it is a recommendation but um, you should follow our other regulations for proper labeling of your device to determine whether or not um, you should be labeling your device as non-pyrogenic. 
And it's, it's to your advantage to go ahead and take a look at the guidances and the standards that address this and, and, and um, carefully make a determina determination about what you want to do moving forward. But you can also implement testing for devices that you currently have 510K clearance on. That's an option for you, and it's probably to your advantage if you make that assessment and determine that it's a valuable thing to do. Okay. All right. Just, just to be clear, that it basically that's not FDS position to retrospectively require uh, uh, labeling of those products already on the market just by this guidance document. We should follow whatever other uh, document you said uh, for that particular device for that assessment. Is that is that true? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question will come from Pamela Barrows of HCM. Your line is open. Um, good afternoon. My question is about uh, pyrogenicity. Um, the slide said that alternatives to batch release are acceptable uh, if you have a sampling plan and the justification. And my question is, would the, uh, would the FDA expect a risk assessment for SP72, or would other formats for justification be acceptable? Thank you. I think that really depends on what the justification is and how well it's substantiated. So, um, you know, we would encourage you to get in contact uh, with the uh, branch of the division that would be reviewing that particular device type and discuss it with them. Thank you. Our next question will come from Dennis Gilfoyle of Johnson & Johnson. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Um, uh, thank you very much for taking my question and uh, a very nice presentation. I, I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that um, we often need to know are names of individuals within the FDA, specifically the CDRH, who are considered the experts in, let's say, in the case I'm asking for is the endotoxin area. Uh, if I was to want to talk to somebody with the expertise in endotoxins on medical devices, who can I contact and who would that individual will be? I think the best way to get into contact with the experts, with any expert, but in that in particular, is to go through DICE, D-I-C-E. That's still up on the screen there, Division of the Industry and Consumer Education. They'll be able to connect you with um, not only one of the experts for that, but also may be able to steer you towards somebody who knows something about your product line in particular. Okay. Thank you. And again, if you do have a question at this time, it is star one. Please do record your first and last name at the prompt. Our next question will come from Stephen Inglis of Quality Solutions and Support. Your line is open. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. Uh, we support um, small business manufacturers, device manufacturers in the industry for regulatory and quality. On the regulatory side with 510Ks, in particular, where pyrogenicity testing is required, would it be acceptable if the manufacturer of the material provides the testing to us for that submission versus the actual device itself that has that material contained within? Would that be acceptable, sir? Are you talking about the pyrogenicity testing in particular? Yes, yes sir, I am. So if there are a lot of tests in particular where we really want to see data based on the final finished product. And this is an example of that. So we don't know how the, how the materials are going to change or how um, – or, or how the bio burden might change or any other contaminants might change from when the raw material is produced to when what is actually on the final finished product. So that's our recommendation there. Understood. Thank you very much. Our next question will come from Heather Nigro, Next Stage Medical. Okay. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question about um, filtration methods. I noticed that the guidance says that filtration methods and um, aseptic processing are outside of the scope. Does that mean that FDA won't consider any new filtration methods as novel? Uh, this is Elaine Mayhall, reviewer in the Infection Control Branch. Um, this guidance is uh, focused on sterilization and the fill of microorganisms and not the exclusion. Um, so it wouldn't be considered um, as a novel method. It would need to go um, 
then it's an A50 process. Okay. Thank you. Our next question will come from Patty Smith of Abbott Medical Optics. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I know that we said for the guidance that an established category A sterilization method, we do not need to submit any data, like say the half cycle method. I was wondering if there is any specific information that FDA would like to see in our submissions regarding these methods if we are not submitting the data itself. For uh, if you're not submitting what itself? The data. The, oh. the guidance talks about how we do not need to submit the data. So I was wondering. Uh, for an established category A sterilization method, if there is any specific information that uh, if you would like to see included in the body of the submission um, if the data is not being provided, like say the half cycle method or other so, methods of sterilization. Right. If you go through the guidance document and um, take a look at the particular things that are asked for in each category, that should be able to help you out a lot. So we're not looking for a tremendous amount of information regarding the validation in particular. Again, we're very comfortable with including uh, identification of the method that is used to validate. So you may want to spell out half cycle method if that's what you've used um, or some other method. Um, but we're not looking at that for established A in detail. We're very comfortable with the idea of you being in conformance with an FDA recognized standard. Um, and that's not to say that it all doesn't have to be conducted and documented and on file at your facilities because um, the Office of Compliance is really responsible when they do their inspections for taking a look at that. So all of it has to be done, but for the obtaining of a 510K clearance, we're looking for the information that's actually outlined in this guidance document. All right, thank you. Our next question will come from Stacey Bonnell. Your line is open. Hello, this is actually uh, Nicholas Funtalakis from the Pew uh, instead of Stacey. But the question is, um, has there been any consideration for the information required in a 510K submission where that submission's only purpose is uh, to support a design change on the product where there's no change in the sterilization method? That's the whole question. <laughs> Sorry, this is Rebecca Nipper, ODE. So you're saying that you made a design change, you have not changed the sterilization method at all? Yeah, that's correct. So I think you would follow the normal procedures just like you would any other time that you make a design change to your device. Um, so if you, under, say, our special 510K program, if you previously would not have needed to submit sterilization information, you still wouldn't. I don't think this guidance changes that. Right. I, I agree. I don't think this guidance changes it. And if you're looking for more information on that in particular, um, there is a FDA guidance document which is entitled pretty close to uh, deciding when to submit a new 510K document. And there's a section in there that does address changes in sterility. And Two of the highlighted items in there are one is if the SAL is changed, the sterility assurance level, and the other one is if the change in sterilization method affects the performance of the device. Yeah, um, sure. but, I, but I, I would yeah. encourage you to take a closer look at that. Sure. That, um, I guess I was asking more um, with respect to pyrogen, pyrogenicity testing and pyrogen, the information that would need to be included with regard to pyrogens or that's that same sterilization method. Okay, so if there's a design change um, and perhaps you're using different materials or more materials or anything that could really affect the pyrogen levels, the bacterial endotoxin levels on the device, um, we would expect that your in place, your, your routine um, conduction of pyrogen testing would account for that. Okay, so basically you're saying that if the design change could impact pyrogen, pyrogen levels on the device, then we should show that appropriately. I would test that right up front. Yep. I would encourage testing that right up front and become, it would be an integral part of future um, ongoing lot release testing of, of product. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Okay. Again, if you do have a question, that is star one at this time. 
Our next question in queue will come from Cherry Wan of Mimetics. Your line is open. Hello. Hi, this is Cherry Wan from Mimetics. Um, I have a question regarding to um, package test data. Um, so according to the guidance, actually, from seems like both from 2016 and 2008, um, the package test data is not required um, for submission. So is it possible you can provide some guidance on how then we should um, provide shelf life data? So, for example, we plan on doing um, a five-year shelf life accelerated aging and real aging study. However, we'll obviously submit our 510K way before that's complete. At which point can we submit our data, our package um, to the agency? Can we submit as soon as our methods are um, solidified rather than the study complete? Um, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, I think there, there are actually a couple of points there that are relevant. Um, going back to the, to the K90-1, the 1990 version, um, we're looking for um, a description of the packaging, um, but not the package data itself. But ever since then and through now, what we're looking for, it, it, it is um, incumbent upon the Office of Compliance to be able to take a look at that data, which should be on file uh, with your office, um, for any of the products for which you have received 510K clearance. Um, another, a better way of saying that is, while we may not look at it when a 510K is submitted, it's all of the validation testing for all of the processes should be conducted and all the data on file with the applicant. Um, when it comes to um, package integrity, uh, um, shelf life testing, again, some Divisions don't particularly look at, at um, expiration dating or shelf life claims on the package during the 510K process. If you make a claim, you should have the data on file. And for some device types in particular, depending on the division that they're reviewed by, they do want to see expiration uh, validation dating uh, data. So it should be included in that submission. And, and I think a little bit more to the point of your question, um, we do accept, for 510K submissions, we do accept accelerated aging as a simulation. Obviously, if you want to put a five-year shelf life uh, claim on a product to do real-time dating, uh, real-time um, validation of that would, would take you at least five years. Um, so we've, we've accepted for a long time uh, the premise that um, accelerated aging is an adequate approach for simulated aging, for simulating aging, and following it by a good seal strength test um, would give you sufficient data to support your, your shelf life claim. Does that answer your question? Yep, it does. Thank you. Okay. And obviously, accelerated aging can be performed in a much shorter time period. And at this time, I'm showing no other questions in the queue. If you do have a question, please press star 1 at this time and record your first and last name at the prompt. Again, that is star 1 if you do have a question at this time. It will take just a moment for questions to queue. Our first question will come from Marsha Palmer of NAMSA. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I just have a question about the previous question about the accelerated aging because we have found that accelerated aging is not always accepted um, for the shelf life and that FDA has required real-time data before they'll give us a shelf life of, you know, past six months. Uh, for the purpose of clarifying the question, we're basically talking about sterility issues here and uh, package integrity for, the, for that, for whatever claim is on there. But there may be other issues that come up. So um, with regard to the product performance or components of the device, okay. um, performance of the product is a separate um, shelf life issue. Is that, are you, um, are you asking just about the packaging and, and shelf and the um, well, it, it, when maintenance of sterility? Your final, yeah, your final device, it's a little hard to separate the two. 
you know, you can't you can't release your packaging without releasing the whole device, so it really doesn't get you anywhere. You know, if if you can use the five year accelerated aging to release your package, but you can't use it to release your product, then it really doesn't benefit you. This is Becky Nepper with ODE. Um, I think if you are having or seeing inconsistencies in review practices, I think the best thing you could do would be um, to notify us um, through other means, and we can try to resolve the issue internally if we're having inconsistency in particular areas. Okay, and who would that contact be? Um, I think you could go through DICE, the information okay. that is up there, and that will reach the appropriate individual. Okay, thank you. And again, there may be reason. There may be a reason for that. Packaging should be reviewed consistently, but if there are certain coatings on devices, um, the reviewers from those particular um, uh, divisions reviewing those particular devices may have good reason to say that we can't accept um, accelerated aging on this. That um, that progress of aging on this may not follow first order kinetics, and um, we really want to see real time aging. Okay. Our next question comes from Lizia Reiskoff of Cooper Vision. Your line is open. Thank you. It's Lizia Reiskoff, but uh, this is hard to tell. So, um, my question is about what is the minimal minimum shelf life data or the time of period of shelf life uh, if they accept in 510K? For example, if I have um, shelf life data equivalent to six months of real time, or it is six months of real time data. I think I under, understand your question. I'll try to answer it. If I miss, please feel free to repeat the question. But um, for 510k submissions, we look we're we're willing to accept accelerated aging data, but we accept that basically as a surrogate for real-time data. So we expect confirmatory real-time testing to be done. So, and that's not a condition. Submitting that data is not a condition of 510K clearance. The accelerated aging may be, but the real-time data we expect just to be included uh, in the file later on when it's completed. Yes, thank you. I understand that. So. Uh, but at the time of the marketing, what is the minimum period of shelf life? Because I read in the, um, I think I think I read uh, the guidance of the TMA submission. It was said there six months minimum. So oh. is it the yeah? This guidance does not provide a specification for that. Um, it depends on the device type. Again, and it is also partly your call. If you're trying to get a five-year shelf life on something or a two-year shelf life on something, it's up to you to justify it with your validation. Yeah, thank you. I understand this dictates the uh, how to say the expiration date on the label, but you so there is no specific requirement. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Schaefer of CFI Medical. Your line is open. There is a uh, long-standing guidance on bundling of multiple devices uh, for a single submission, uh, and that guidance uh, addresses uh, conditions and, and uh, uh, means of determining what's a legitimate bundle. Uh, are the various elements of the new sterilization submission guidance consistent with that uh, bundling approach? I believe, I believe so, if I understand your, your question correctly. Um, there is a guidance related to bundling, but there's also, I'm um, kind of looking at this at two different levels. One is the guidance that uh, addresses that specifically. Another one is sort of is the issue of adopting products into existing validated families of devices. Um, for example, um, for ethylene oxide sterilization, TIR-28 includes information as to how to make the assessment that um, for, for um, process adoption, um, assuring that one product 
can be adopted into a family of devices that have already been validated based on a worst case configure a worst case device. So um, I'm not seeing how this guidance really affects either one of those guidances at all. Uh, all of the principles would still apply. Okay, that's fine. I was only asking about the uh, 510K side. We certainly understand this, the sterilization uh, challenge family adoption side as a separate issue. Um, we we have several thousand products, and a number of them uh, uh, can be reasonably grouped into large families that have common materials and common processes, uh, but differing geometries. Um, so uh, all that I was talking about was the 510K side uh, in relation to uh, commonality of sterilization details. So, okay, thank you very much. Our final question in queue will come from Jared Desrosiers of Millstone Medical Outsourcing. Your line is open. Hi, my name, I'm actually Dylan Zygmunt from Millstone Medical, um, but uh, we just had a question in regards to the pyrogen testing. Uh, what does the FDA consider a batch? Is it one single lot of product, or, or can it be a whole batch of product which is sterilized at the same time? So we were just wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Well, that's a good question. I would really encourage you to take a look at FT72 for that. Um, if that doesn't give you the answer, because that has that does provide uh, information in the body of the, of the standard as well as information in the annexes about small batch release. Um, so I would encourage you to refer to that, and if it's not clear, I would encourage you to get in touch with DICE and uh, find one of our experts to talk to about that. Um, so it's good to have that information before rather than after making your submission. Thank you. And with that, I will turn the call back over to Ms. I here. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation and transcript will be made available on the CDRH Learn webpage at www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH Learn by Friday, February 19th. If you have any additional questions about the final guidance document, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for participating, and this concludes today's webinar. With that, we will conclude today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>